Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to session 4 for Principles of Management course. I am Dr. Shikha N. Khera, faculty member at Delhi School of Management, Delhi Technological University. This session 4 is Development of Management Thought Part 2. In the previous session, Development of Management Part 1, we had discussed about how the management thought emerged in the pre-modern era then we discussed about the management term and its various connotations in different languages and further we discussed on the approaches to management under which we started off with the classical approach to management and we discussed Taylor's scientific principles of management and Henry Fiol's principles of management which have universal application. So today we will carry forward and move on to the third theory for classical approach to management. The evolution of management thought is a process that started in early days of man. In the previous module, we introduced the major approaches to management theories. We must keep in mind that each approach that we discussed in the previous module or we are going to discuss today were given by these thinkers based on their historical timeline, the situations and interest of the researchers. So from their perspective, they have shared their viewpoints. But in today's time, all these viewpoints helped us to have best practices or gave us the platform for emergence of contemporary management practices. Let us see now the third that is the bureaucratic theory under the classical approach by Max Weber. A German scientist Max Weber describes bureaucracy as an institution that is highly organized, formalized and also impersonal. He also developed the belief that there must be a fixed hierarchical structure for an organization and clear rules and regulations and lines of authority that regulate it. Max Weber introduced a new organizational form in which hierarchy of authority, a system of rules are considered to be vital. This is called bureaucracy. According to Weber, bureaucracy is the exercise of control on the basis of knowledge. Weber envisaged that bureaucracy will discourage decisions based on favoritism and family connections and encourage decisions based on knowledge, experience and expertise. Clearly, rational legal authority of managers is critical to decision making in bureaucratic organizations. Bureaucracy also strives at making effective use of authority to achieve organizational goals. So the common characteristics of bureaucratic organizations are hiring based on qualification, merit based promotions, chain of command, division of labor, neutrality of application of rules and regulations, reports and records in written form and separation of ownership from management. Ideally, bureaucratic organizations can reduce the importance of charisma and improve the control of supervisors over subordinates, allow subordinates to challenge the decisions of superiors by referring to existing rules, facilitate consistency in administration and ensure organization's long-term stability. However, this style of management can be effective 
only in those organizations where the superiors have more knowledge and technical competence than their subordinates. Let us in detail now study the division of labor and rest as given by the Weber. So, division of labor as also proposed by F. W. Taylor and then later on by Henry Fiol is specialized work. Authority hierarchy is having an organization structure in the organization that helps people to understand the reporting relationships. These reporting relationships are extremely important when it comes to giving orders or receiving orders. Formal selection in the organization is also similar to the scientific selection given by Henry by F. W. Taylor and here the formal selection means that tools for selection should be very much in place whether it is a interview, whether it is an employment test and the employment test must have various components which lead directly to the work performance. Then formal rules and regulations or we may say rigid rules and regulations which are the main ingredient of any bureaucratic organization should be followed appropriately because it is this rule book only which enables the manager to follow all the norms and give the directions to the subordinates. These rules and regulations also serve as the standards as well as the evaluating criteria when we are judging the performance. Moving on to the next factor that Weber proposed in ideal bureaucracy is the career orientation. Weber supported that unless otherwise we give career planning or career orientation to the employees, there is not much lucrative in the job that an employee will remain with us. And in contemporary times also, various organizations are facing this issue of talent retention. And the, the reason behind this challenge of talent retention or high attrition rate is one of the reason could be the lack of career orientation or career planning for the employees. Because it is this career planning only for which an employee thinks of remaining in the organization for a longer duration. Thus, Weber has proposed all the relevant structures which are even today very much appropriate with respect to effective organization pattern. Moving further, now we have completed the discussion on the classical approach to management. The classical approaches to management enable us to understand the management of people and management of processes and physical assets in a systematic manner wherein F. W. Taylor helped us to understand what is the importance of motivation and morale for employee, what is the importance of division of labor, heartily cooperating amongst each other is solicited and along with that the scientific selection of employees and giving them training as per requirement. Further, Henry Fiol added on in classical uh, classical approach to management, various 14 principles of management which have a true significance in today's time. And finally, Max Weber who came up with the bureaucratic theory of management. After classical theory or classical approach to management, let us now move on to the behavioral approach to the management. Let us see what are the theories that we have to study under this category. In contrast to classical approach, which focuses on the technical aspects of management and behavioral approach emphasizes on improving the management through psychological makeup. So that is very important. Here we have to talk about the psychological makeup of the individual. This approach insists on the importance of understanding the human resources and their thinking patterns. This approach also known as human resource approach looks to solve the labor management conflicts likely to arise out of classical approaches to the management. The focus area of behavioral approach are conflict prevention, T 
टीम वर्क मोटिवेशन लीडरशिप एंड कम्युनिकेशन द थ्री इम्पॉर्टेंट स्टडीज दैट कॉन्ट्रीब्यूटेड ग्रेटली टू द डेवलपमेंट ऑफ बिहेवियरल अप्रोच आर हाउथ्रॉन स्टडीज देन वी हैव बिहेवियरल साइंस थ्योरीज ह्यूमन रिसोर्स अप्रोच एंड ह्यूमन रिलेशंस मूवमेंट लेट एस नाउ स्टडी द फर्स्ट बिहेवियरल अप्रोच दैट इज द हाउथ्रॉन स्टडीज इन द हाउथ्रॉन स्टडीज the engineers of western electric hawthorn plant chicago they conducted a scientific experiment to study the impact of lighting on employee productivity in this regard they made the employees into two groups one the experimental group and the other was the control group and what they did they increased and decreased the elimination of light the magnitude of elimination in both the groups to their surprise the elimination increased not only in the experimental group but in controlled group as well which actually puzzled the engineers that why is it so that despite the elimination is less still the productivity is increasing this puzzle led to the inclusion of one more person into the experiments who is elton mayo elton mayo was a harvard professor and when he was included in the hawthorn experiments he added on one more series of experiments to it to try to find out the effect of external factors on productivity here there were six ladies who were chosen to be part of this experiment and they were the workers in the hawthorn plant these six ladies were given convenient rest times higher wages and flexible weekdays and it was seen that during these facilities the production was increasing and after some time these three benefits were withdrawn and even when these benefits were withdrawn to the surprise of the researchers the productivity kept increasing so they were in in the end they could conclude that there is not much relationship between the external factors and the productivity of the workers and they concluded by saying that it is the group atmosphere group culture group attitude that affects the productivity more than the external factors so how much is the affinity amongst the team members what is the cohesiveness of the team members that played a major role in hawthorn experiments and let us understand and helped us actually understand that how people in group behave and what gives them platform for higher productivity so the results of hawthorn studies drastically improved the importance of people in the organization this pioneering study compelled organizations to take a closer look at the social factors that influenced the employee behavior and organizational productivity and performance this study also helped the management to understand the role and relevance of trade unions as the representatives of the employees moving further let us now move on to the next approaches of behavioral science that is human resource approach under human resource approach we have three researchers to discuss upon these human resource approach or human resource management approach is the scientific approach to nurturing and supporting employees and ensuring a positive workplace environment its functions vary across different businesses and industries but typically it includes recruitment compensation and benefits training and development employee relations etc so researchers who contributed in the field of human resource management are Mary Parker Follett 
Robert Owen and Hugo Minsterberg. Let us discuss their contribution. Mary Parker Follett, who was an American management consultant, a social worker and a philosopher and pioneer in the field of organization theory and organizational behavior, along with Lineal Gilbert, she was one of the two great women who were management experts of early days of classical management theory. She has been called as the mother of modern management and that is a big achievement that Mary Parker Follett had achieved. Instead of emphasizing on industrial and in mechanical components, she advocated for what she saw as the as far more important is the human element. regarding people as the most valuable commodity present within any business. She was one of the first theorists to actively write about and explore the role people had on effective management and discuss the importance of learning to deal with and promote positive human relations as a fundamental aspect of industrial sector. So here she recognized the importance of group behavior in the organization. So, from the perspective of individual and group behavior, organization needs to be studied. As even if you have all the gadgets and equipments in your organization, you have best of technology also, but who puts all these things into place? It is nothing but the human element. So, this is what Mary Parker Follett focused upon. The next scientist or researcher in behavioral science theory is Robert Owen. Robert Owen was a Welsh textile manufacturer and a philanthropist and social reformer. He was the founder of cooperative movements. He focused on and strove to improve factory working conditions, promoted experimental socialist communities and sought a more collective approach to child rearing including government control of education. He gained wealth in early 1800s from a textile mill in Scotland in 1828. Robert Owen continued to champion the working class leading to develop cooperatives and the trade union movements and support the child labor legislation and free educational schools. Here Robert Owen claimed that a concern for employee was profitable for management and would relieve the human misery. So the more the organizational members are concerned towards or are empathetic towards the employees higher would be the benefit in turn it will create the commitment on the part of the employee. This is what Robert Owen advocated. Now let us see what Hugo Munzberg focused on. Munzberg created the field of industrial psychology, the scientific study of individuals at work to maximize their productivity and adjustment. He was a German born American psychologist who believed that psychology should be used to help solve real world problems. So real world problems according to him is not the artificial intelligence or technology things only. It is the psychology or the cognitive ability of human beings that can resolve these real world problems. With human behavior, he pioneered applied psychology in United States and made a significant impact in the field of industrial psychology as such. So thus, moving further, after human resource approach, we move on to the human relations approach. Human relations approach is basically focused upon a satisfied worker. So here many theorists came up with the theories of motivation to help the management or the organization understand what is the importance if you have a satisfied worker and what gains an organization can get out of it. 
so this belief on importance of employee satisfaction led to the emergence of various theories of management out of which one of the most important theories of management or theories of motivation includes abraham maslow's need hierarchy theory where maslow has talked about that every individuals have the needs in hierarchical orders and these needs are the basic driving force for any individual to promptly take actions in life the five needs in hierarchical order that abraham maslow focused on or has proposed includes first the physiological needs then the safety needs third social needs fourth self esteem need and fifth self actualization need where abraham maslow and his counterpart hersberg came up that there could be hygiene factors in the organization that is the physiological needs the safety needs and the social needs they are the hygiene factors in organization which are mandatorily required by all organizational members so that they are motivated the second part of their theory says that apart from hygiene factors there there are motivational factors also and these motivational factors could be self actualization and self esteem so that is this scenario when an individual reaches to a reputation and status stage and then feels that he has a sense of belongingness to the place so these theory enabled the researchers to find out the importance of human satisfaction at place of work along with these two theories another theorist douglas macgregor also came up with the theory of motivation where he talked about that employees can be after a series of experiments he came up with two theories that employees can be categorized into either theory x or theory y theory x employees are the ones which inherently dislike the work while theory y employees are the ones who are initiative or responsibility seeking or leadership Uh, behavioral employees so thus as a result the various motivation theorists gave us the platform to find out what motivates an individual like in theory x and y by macgregor it was proposed that theory x individuals need to be catered with a stick while the theory y individuals can be given a reward so this is how behavioral scientists have contributed and human relation movement is when an organization decides to study the behavioral characteristics of workers particularly in group in their workplace and focuses on what motivates each employee to be more productive in the office settings now that we have discussed about the behavioral approaches we move on to the third approach that is the quantitative approach the application of mathematical and statistical models information models and computer simulations for managerial problem solving and decision making is the essence of quantitative approach this approach is also called as management science approach since it is generally viewed as an extension of taylor's scientific approach this approach may be defined as an approach to management that uses rigorous quantitative techniques to help the managers make maximum use of organizational resources the mathematical techniques adopted for the quantitative approach are linear and nonlinear programming queuing theory chaos theory economic order quantity etc the primary purpose of applying these techniques in management is to improve the quality and accuracy of the managerial decisions then we have total quality management as one such area where quantitative techniques have proven to be extremely useful tqm can be defined as the organizational approach for meeting customer needs and expectations that involves all managers and employees in using quantitative methods to improve continuously the organization's 
processes, products and services. The TQM method normally employed in TQM are the quantitative methods normally employed in TQM are the statistical process control, ISO 9000 series, Pareto diagram or analysis, matrix diagram, histograms, decision trees, critical path analysis and fishbone diagrams. So, here we can see that TQM is basically a philosophy and set of guidelines for continuous improvement. And what are the three aspects of continuous improvement in TQM? The internal customer, the external customer and continuous improvement of the processes. Now moving on to the contemporary approaches. What are the contemporary approaches? We have two contemporary approaches to understand here. One is the systems approach, the other one is the contingency approach. Let us understand these two approaches in detail. In this approach, the management views the organization as a complex and unified system composed of several interrelated and interdependent subsystems. So, here we are talking about set of independent and interrelated systems and organization is a unified whole. So, you can see it as that this is an organization which is a unified whole. There are systems and subsystems in the organization. These systems and subsystems are interrelated and interdependent on each other. Like in organization, you have subsystems like production management, financial management, human resource management, supply chain management. All these subsystems are interrelated and interconnected to each other. Change in any one subsystem leads to have an effect on the other subsystem also. So, for example, if an advertisement has to be made, so the budgeting will be affected, thus the financial management also has to be included here. If we are taking a decision of recruitment, again the financial management has to be considered. So, similarly, all these subsystems are interrelated and interdependent on each other. Now, in this approach, the systems approach can have closed system and open system. The systems approach allows management to view the whole organization as a subsystem of larger external environment. Now, when a company lives in a system that is not influenced or does not interact with the outside environment, we call that as a closed system. While when an organization interacts with the external environment, we call it as an open system like no organization can survive without having an interaction with the external environmental factors including society, customers, suppliers or maybe political scenarios, technology etc. Under closed system, we can only have prison as an example where minimum amount of external environmental factors affect or no exchange of information from with external environment takes place. So, thus a system as a system organization is class classified into two categories. Now, when we discuss about the external environment influence under the systems approach, let us take an example of a cement company. A cement company may see itself as part of cement industry and again the cement industry can be viewed as a subsystem of national economy. Thus each element of the business can be a subsystem of the larger element as well as a system for a smaller element which it is made up of. So here if this is an organization it is a subsystem for larger economy that is for nation. For nation organization is the subsystem, for organization HR finance marketing is a subsystem. So, this is the systems approach under the contemporary approaches. Let us now move on to the contingency approach. Now, the contingency approach says that individuals cannot be managed in the same manner because of difference in the situations. So, what may be true for one organization where an employee has got high motivation and morale due to one practice 
and it increases the organizational performance may not be true for some other organization. So, thus situation and the individual differences need to be considered when we take appropriate strategies for managing the human beings in the organization. This is what contingency approach focuses on. Further, the due to increasing customer diversity, employee diversity, legal and ethical regulations and technological and environmental changes, this approach has gained more popularity among the managers in recent times. The contingency approach is sometimes called situational approach also and it says that organizations are different and face different situations that is contingencies and require different ways of managing it. A good way to, def a good way to describe contingency approach is if then. So, if a situation arises then what could be the appropriate strategy is how we assure the contingency approach. Contingency approach depends on multiple factors and the factors as proposed by various thinkers and researchers include the size of the organization, routineness of task technology, environmental uncertainty and individual differences. When it comes to size of the organization, if the organization is larger, conflicts are inevitable, situationals can be complex. Thus, the strategies to manage such situations would be different as compared to the organizations which are relatively smaller in size and have less of such situations. The second factor that is routineness of task technology. So, if the organization is surviving with the task technology which is reoccurring in nature and probably it has some immunity from the external environment, then the management practices would be differing as compared to the environment which is very volatile and dynamic and the technology of routine task is continuously changing. Thus, the approach of situational or contingency has to be applied to address to such situations. The third factor that affects the organization is environmental uncertainty. As I just mentioned, if the environment is highly volatile and dynamic, in certain situations the, the existing strategies will not be affecting. So, we need to remodify the strategies based on the kind of environmental uncertainty that the organization is facing. And finally, it talks about individual differences. Individual differences for both the managers as well as the subordinates. The manager has its own style of working and this individual difference may find it difficult to adapt to specific strategies which are already written down. So, probably in such scenarios with difference in individual, the situational strategies also needs to be reshaped. So, this is about the contingency approach. Now, let us move on to the organization environment where this contingency approach or the survival of organization takes place. This organizational setup and environment has certain factors into it. So, this is the organization environment and the broad factors that we would be discussing includes the internal environment, the general environment and the task environment. Let us see what is there in the internal environment. As you can see three parties are written here, employees, shareholders and organization culture. So, what is an employee? The employee are the determinants of the organizational setup. This is because they affect or they get affected by the existing internal environment. Now, what are the factors in the employees that affect the internal environment? Employees individual style, their perception, their work attitude and their aptitude, their personality types, 
all these things frame the internal environment of the organization. The second category is the shareholders. Now under the shareholder category, they are the ultimate owners of the organization. They provide capital, take risk and get a share in the profit or loss of the business. Generally, shareholders have both direct and indirect influence on the organizational environment. They directly influence the environment through voting rights by approving the major corporate decisions. They indirectly influence the environment through the board of directors elected by them who manage the routine affairs of the organization. It is important for managers to give utmost importance to the near interest of the shareholders. Understandably, managers operate under an environment and create jointly by shareholders and the internal stakeholders. Coming on to the third factor that is the organization culture. Now, what are the factors that frame a culture? These are the beliefs, values, code of conducts and ethics in the organization that create the organization culture. And this culture when created in the right perspective gives a platform to employees to inculcate high morale and positivity to and commitment towards the organization. So organization culture is also an important ingredient or a factor that contributes to the internal environment. It directly flows down from the leadership philosophy, the kind of leadership practices or the kind of leadership behavior that is practiced in organization, it gets disseminated downwards. So if for example, a leader himself, a leader himself is highly disciplined and fosters creativity, the same kind of practices will be followed by the subordinates also. Moving further to the task environment that contributes to the organizational environment here, under the task environment, it is created by the forces that interact frequently with the organization. As such, the actions of customers, suppliers, competitors, distributors, trade unions and pressure groups, they shape this environment. This is vital to the accomplishment of the organizational goals because it directly and constantly influences managers decisions and actions we shall now see the roles of each of the important constituents of the task group so first are the customers we all understand that customers are the most important factors because of which the organization exists because it is the need and desire of the customer that the organization has to fulfill. So the task environment has to be framed in such a manner that gives the output to the product in terms of shape, feature, design and delivery of services as per the requirement of the customer. There should be a platform given to the customer that enables the customer to give appropriate feedback and review about the products and the services. Next in line are the suppliers. This term refers to all those who supply production inputs to the organization in the form of raw materials, labor equipments, etc. It also includes those who provide financial inputs to the business such as banks and insurance companies. To ensure a smooth and steady conduct of the business operations, the corporation and the commitment of the suppliers are very, very important for managers. In order to have long-term relationship with suppliers, the managers must develop a mutual trust and understanding with them. The third category that comes under the task environment are the competitors. Now who are the competitors? Competitors are the basic deriving force behind an organization's quest for innovation and development. It is the, con it is the competitor which prompts the organization to take up those research initiatives and develop and enhance the services better than what the competitor is 
offering it gives a healthy spirit to the organization to go in for what competitive moves are but at times these competitive moves are derived by certain tactics or strategy that can eventually put the organization in trouble too so one has to see from the competitive point of view that what kind of strategy is going on whether it is a blue ocean that is competition is less or whether it is a red ocean that there is a bloody competition going on so competitor gives us forces or pushes the organization to develop a specific kind of task environment it is because of the technology that the competitor uses the manager or the organizational setup also is forced to buy such technologies and upgrade themselves so the task environment is reshaped accordingly then comes the distributors distributors of the product or services of an organization also influence the environment of the managers the distributors list normally include wholesalers stockist brokers agents and retailers distributors engage themselves in product acquisition product movement and product transaction that is selling based on their experience in sales promotion customer service and advertising distribution they pass vital information to managers about the market characteristics it also includes the changing taste and preference of the customer they can also help managers decide the right product in right quantity for right promotion techniques for the market next is the trade union trade unions are the unions which the organizational employees or workers form together this is the group which is the representative of organization workers with respect to any grievances they are facing or any conditions of working they want to get amendment in trade unions also affect the task environment to a very large extent trade unions force the management to bring in certain kind of new technologies maybe or maybe some welfare measures or bring in change into their working conditions that eventually helps the management to evolve their management practices finally it is the pressure groups that affect or shape the task environment they are the organized groups of members who believe in the same cause and shared sympathy they work together to influence individuals and institutions that have the power to make decisions for instance anti smoking groups may exert pressure on the government to ban or regulate the sale of tobacco in the country in this way these groups may bring pressure on the activities of tobacco companies it is therefore important for managers to take notice of the activities of pressure groups so that the attempt is made to influence the company or the product is relieved and finally the third factor that affects the organization environment is the general environment the broad factors and situations that affects almost all organization and industry are called the general environmental factors though this environment remains external to the organization it still has an indirect influence on managerial decision making process so any change in the general environment will either pose a threat or an opportunity for the manager and when this opportunity or threat is posed the manager has to accordingly see the strengths and weaknesses that the organization has and make the appropriate practice or strategy into place let us see the factors of general environment in this case the first one is the social environment what are the factors under social environment that influences the organization so it can be the lifestyle of 
So as we are discussing about the general environment, the very first factor under general environment is the social environment. And what comprises of social environment are the values, beliefs and cultural norms of the individuals, customers, suppliers, shareholders with respect to the organization. Every society has distinct identity with respect to their cultural norms. And the individual who survive in that society have certain value systems. When these individuals come to the organization as internal customers or employees, they bring those value system to the organization. This value system directly or indirectly affects the organizational processes and settings. Thus, the social environment plays a greater role on the part of general environment affecting the organizational structure. Moving further, it talks about that in India many organizations have a diversified workforce also. So since the employees typically reflect the diverse characteristics of Indian population, these employees represent different regions, ethnic groups and ideologies. So, a culturally and ethnically diverse workforce poses direct challenges for organizations and decisively influence the environment of the managers. Thus, the social environmental factor is a major phenomenon in Indian industrial organization. Let us now briefly discuss the factors that influence the social environment of business organization further. It may be the demographics of the society, that is what is the gender mix, what is the lifestyle of individual, what is the income level of people living in the society or what is the per capita earnings. Also the educational status of the society play a major role. Is the population literate or the population is illiterate which is tomorrow going to be the employee mix of the organization role of women in society and women empowerment level in society also plays a major role in social environment affecting the organization. Further moving on to the technological environment, we all understand it very well that the technological environment is ever growing and the kind of upgradations or research that is taking place in the field of technology are giving us a breakthrough outputs. So as a result the organization since we have already discussed the organization is an open system, it interacts with the external environment, so it has to deal with the kind of changes or new technologies that the environment is posing and thus the organization has to do twofold initiatives. One, they have to bring in change into their machinery systems tools and equipments and second they have to give training to their employees so as to be able to operate on those tools, equipments and machineries. So this is how technological environment affects the general environment or the organizational environmental structure. The next environment that we would be dealing about is the political environment. The philosophies of the political parties are called the political ideologies. Political ideologies guide the approach of political institutions towards industrial activities, particularly those involving the rights of the employees. So ideologies may determine the government policies and intervention strategies, attitudes towards trade unions, labor legislations and towards the foreign firms. So the prevailing political environment usually influence the functioning of management in various ways. For instance, the tax policies and trade regulations are usually influenced by the political dimension of the external environment. It is therefore necessary for managers to develop and enhance their awareness of the political environment. Next in line is the legal environment. Legal environment talks about the policies and laws that govern the organization. 
it can be the administrative laws it can be the taxation policies can be the case laws so we have very many industrial legislations that govern an organization and helps the employees employer and government that is the tripartite to work in congruence with each other for example the industrial development act 1947 enables the workers to find out a settlement machinery for their disputes or conflicts so same goes true even for the employers that they also seek the help of such a machinery to resolve the issues further we have economic environment economic environment refers to the nature and direction of economy in which the organization competes or may compete with each other an economic environment is formed by the combination of economic factors like national income population cyclic fluctuations in economy labor market conditions interest rates and globalization of economy these factors actually influence the behavior of consumer as well as affects the supplier and the organizational chain thus it becomes an very important factor for general environment then comes the last factor under the general environment that is the natural environment the natural environment comprises of the geographic region where the organization is flourishing or established under the natural environment we have factors like what kind of water contamination or air pollution or unsafe disposal of solid or hazardous waste is taking place is my organization or the organization in discussion goes for soil degradation and deforestation because of which we are affecting the yield of the crops global varieties which include ozone depletion global warming all these are the issues which we need to address under the natural environment and because of which in today's time we are talking about sustainable development goals so that we come up with processes and practices which are sustainable which help the future generations to cater with without having any damage to the survival of mankind even at that time including today's time so having discussed about the environment in the organization let us move on and discuss about some recent trends in the management so these recent trends in the management include knowledge management knowledge management is a process that aims at identifying and capturing the knowledge that exists across the organization so under this knowledge management we focus on creation of knowledge analyzing of analysis of knowledge and usage of knowledge to have better development of products and services this knowledge management enables the organization to capture not only the explicit knowledge but also the tacit knowledge that the employees have with them while they are doing their jobs next recent trend in management is the six sigma trend it is a business management strategy for improving the quality of product or service output of an organization now when it comes to six sigma we are talking about some high quality standards by identifying and removing the causes of the defect in manufacturing and business process in this regard it uses a set of quality management methods by adopting statistical methods and employing specifically trained quality experts within the organization these quality experts are generally categorized as black belts and green belts six sigma practices encourage the managers to adopt different sequence of steps in manufacturing and also quantify the financial targets in the form of profit increase and cost reduction generally the quality of a manufacturing process can be described by a sigma rating indicating its yield or the percentage of defect 
free products that it creates. A Six Sigma process is the one in which 99.9% .9 of the product manufactured are statistically expected to be free of defects. It is the 3.4 pa defects parts per million and it was invented by the Motorola company where they developed and experimented that how we can reduce the defects parts per million up to 3.4 parts ppm. An example of Six Sigma initiative of an Indian company is Crompton Greaves. The important segment of business excellence practices of Crompton Greaves is its Six Sigma efforts for quality as perceived by the customer. This company has a separate monitoring framework for a focused review of Six Sigma practices with senior management participation. For example, the, a core committee of all vice presidents of the company headed by the managing director was created to oversee the Six Sigma initiative which was introduced in June 2002. Further, business unit heads were nominated as champions and asked to drive Six Sigma in their divisions. After Six Sigma, the next trend in management is mergers and acquisitions. So, the term merger refers to the combination of two or more organizational setups to find or to form a new category of or a new firm altogether. So, under this, the two or more companies which in which the assets and liabilities of the selling company are absorbed by the buying company, the, the term acquisition means purchase of a plant, division or whole of the company by another company. So, the fundamental difference between merger and acquisition is in merger, it is a friendly handshake between the two organizations to create a new organization while the acquisition is when one person take one organization takes over the other organization. If it is not friendly then it is called as a hostile acquisition by a larger firm a smaller firm is acquired. In mergers and acquisition are extensively used as a technique for restructuring the business. So, what are we doing here? We are restructuring the business. The process of merger and acquisition has been on the rise in India in recent years. When organizations undergo mergers and acquisition, it is the responsibility of the manager to keep the employees focused on their job. Now, this is very important because it is being said that even if the financial mergers take place, but literature speaks that if the cultural integration is not taking place between the organizations, then probability is that the merger may not be highly successful. They also should ensure that strategic business goals and plans are achieved and in this regard, managers must work purposefully to stabilize the organization, secure the confidence and cooperation of employees of firms involved in merger process. So, this is what I mentioned about the cultural integration is highly important. Moving further, in recent times many organizations are enabled by development of information technology. So, information technology is the next trend that we need to discuss. Organization managements ensure maximum utilization of internet based IT enabled services to improve their organizational effectiveness and customer satisfaction. So, organizations outsource some of their business activities like call centers, bank office operations, revenue claim processing, legal databases, HR services, payrolls, logistics management etc. By outsourcing this, this actually enables the managers to deal with new forms of offices wherein part of offices work performed in far off place outside the office and is electronically managed. So, this is what we call in today's time the virtual space. This virtual space enables to reduce the boundary barriers between the individuals sitting across the globe and connect uh, develop a connect between them for organizational working practices. Moving further, 
we have now the last part of it that is one of the recent trends is world class organizations. They are those organizations that are recognized as global leaders in their respective industries and have dominant presence in the market. Now students let us see what are the characteristics of these world class organizations that have made them best in practice organizations. So one is customer centric approach focus on customer and its requirement, continuous improvement, continuous research, development and fostering creativity. Flexibility is reducing rigidity, giving platform to the employees so that they come up with better ideas and they can experiment on it. Innovative programs for HR management, since human resource is a kind of resource where behavioral predictability is highly unpredictable, a dom democratic environment and a technological support. So this is all friends for this session and here we conclude the development of management thought part 2 and I hope you all have understood this content well. Thank you.